Welcome to our second mini lecture for Unit 8 on stellar evolution. In this mini lecture we're going to talk about star birth, how stars form, and also just a little bit about star clusters and how they are useful for learning about stellar evolution. This material comes from sections 1, 2, and 6 of chapter 19 in your text. Let's begin with a basic outline of how stars form and then we'll go and flesh it out. First of all, a star forms when gravity begins to pull cold gas inward, we call it a collapse, into stars. As this gas collapses inward, it begins to heat up, and when it's finally hot enough, nuclear fusion starts, and then we have a star. And in the meantime, while this is going on, disks around the stars can begin to make planets, and we now know that nearly every single star has, uh, likely has planets around it. Back in the last lecture, we talked about dark nebulae, and we said dark nebulae are made of cold gas, so cold that it's transparent, but also these dust grains that don't allow visible light through. Dark nebulae are made primarily of gas, and this gas is so cold that there's virtually no gas pressure. This gas is maybe 10, 20 degrees above absolute zero. So, or virtually no gas pressure, so gravity will be, can begin to pull the gas inward. And as you squeeze gas, the temperature goes up. As the gas falls inward under gravity, it will begin to heat up. This collapse is fast in space terms. You can start with a dark nebula that's a couple light years across, and within about 10, 20 million years, it's collapsed inward and a star has formed. Now as the gas heats up, uh, it begins to glow at ever shorter wavelengths. It's a black body. So as it um, heats up at first, you go from almost no emission to emitting light in radio waves, and then onto microwaves, and then onto infrared light. This picture is from the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is an infrared telescope. In the lower left, you see a little inset that's an optical light picture of a dark nebula with the exciting name of HH46. But when we look in the infrared, we see the larger picture, so this is an infrared picture of that dark nebula. First of all, you can see the background stars because we know infrared light can go through the nebula, but you also see this bright point that's not present in the dark nebula. This is a forming star, and it's now gotten warm enough that it's beginning to glow in infrared light. And then eventually the surface heats up and we can see the star in optical light. Here are optical light pictures of some young stars seen by the Hubble telescope. And what you can hopefully notice is that these are not nice round dots like we're used to seeing for stars. These are very odd shapes. And that's because the star is still mostly invisible and we are seeing a reflection nebula around the star, dust around the star that's perhaps forming the planets, is blocking this light and so we get these weird shapes of the dust cloud uh, in optical light. These shapes, uh, when we study them, we find that they're actually disks. So it's sort of like a frisbee, uh, sometimes seen from the edge on, sometimes seen at an angle, sometimes seen from the top. So on the left here is a picture of one of these disks, and uh, to the right is an artist's conception of what you're seeing. If a, the cold cloud of gas that's falling inward to form a star has any spin at all, as it collapses, it will spin faster and faster. This is something called the conservation of angular momentum. Even if you've never heard of conservation of angular momentum, you probably have seen it in action if you've ever watched women's figure skating the skaters go into a spin. As they start the spin, it's slow, and as they bring their arms inward and upward, they spin faster and faster. This is a common circumstance for any spinning object. The smaller you make it, the closer you bring something that's spinning to the axis of rotation, the faster it will spin. So imagine you have a big cloud of gas that's one or two light years across. By the time you shrink it down to something like the sun, it's going to be spinning pretty fast. Now, if uh, when I was a kid, I liked to get on the merry-go-round and get it going as fast as I could. And when it's going really fast, it's hard to hang on. And if I tried to pull myself towards the center of the merry-go-round, 
it just wouldn't happen. Uh, the same thing happens to these clouds that as it's as the star spins faster and faster the gas and dust that are trying to drain onto the star and make the star bigger um, they're spinning faster and they're finding it more and more difficult to come inward to get onto the star however it can collapse up and down uh, as long as it doesn't get closer to the star it can still be pulled by gravity so what starts off as a big sphere flattens into a rotating disk, a frisbee shape. The star at the center of this disk we call a protostar. It's not doing nuclear fusion yet, um, but around this time once we begin to see it in optical light we often say that the star is at the birth line we can begin to see it, so we can begin to study it in optical light, but the star is often still uh, collecting gas and continuing to grow as the gas drains onto it. And likewise, gravity is still squeezing the star downward. It's slowed way down, it's not falling rapidly anymore, but gravity is still squeezing the star uh, slowly, and as the star shrinks, its center heats up due to the increasing gas pressure. Finally, the center of the star will heat up to over 4 million degrees, and once it gets that hot, nuclear fusion can begin. Now that nuclear fusion has begun, we get the self-regulation of nuclear uh, fusion and energy creation that we talked about back when we did our mini lectures on the sun. This is a gradual transition. It's not a sudden thing. It's not like one instant, oh, still protostar, no fusion. Next instant, it's magically a stable star. This takes hundreds of thousands of years for it to balance out. Now these disks around the star have a lot of the dust that used to be mixed in with the gas. And this dust, as we learned last time, it has ice on it often. Um, there's still some gas mixed in. Uh, you've got the dust particles themselves. And they're in this flat shape and we often call these protoplanetary disks because this is where planets are going to form. And here's some pictures of protoplanetary disks in the Orion Nebula. So you see at the center of each of these pictures is a protostar. Um, it's still growing so it's it's not a star yet. And the dark thing you see around it is a dark nebula basically. It's the disk of dust blocking the background light from the Orion Nebula. So the light you see in the background here is always the Orion Nebula. The disk blocks the light, except right there at the star where we have more light coming out. And this is the dust that could potentially be forming planets around these stars. These dust grains, uh, if you remember, they were kind of fluffy looking. They like to hook together, uh, just like dust bunnies like to form under your bed. We get dust bunnies forming in these disks. Once they get large enough, they begin to uh, heat up and form, stick together further to form pebbles. And the pebbles can stick together to make uh, rocks and boulders and finally up to what we call planetesimals, or very similar to asteroids. And now, once you get something that large, gravity begins to pull it inward and pull other material together, and you can begin to form planets uh, in these disks. This image is an artist's conception of what the protoplanetary disk around a star like the Sun might look like. We have no close-up pictures like this. We, of course, can't travel to them. In the upper left of this artist's picture, though, are two pictures of protoplanetary disks around other stars. In the one on the left, we're seeing the disk almost from the edge. It's like we're looking at the edge of the frisbee. We've blocked out the center star so it doesn't blind the telescope. And on the right is a picture of one where we're looking almost straight down on top of the disk. So straight down on the frisbee so it looks almost like a perfect circle. Again we've had to block out the light from the central star so, so it doesn't blind the telescope. So this is our story of how stars form. You begin with a large dark nebula, maybe a light year or two across. Gravity can pull it inward. As it pulls inwards it tends to spin faster so we make a disk. 
and it begins to heat up uh, as the gas pressure increases. The central part of this disk becomes a protostar, which is going to one day be a star. The gas and dust drain onto it to make it more and more massive, and as gravity pulls it inwards, it uh, squeezes it and makes it hotter and hotter. The rest of the disk can begin to, uh, the dust in there can begin to stick together and to make planets. And once the protostar gets hot enough that nuclear fusion can begin, then we have a star. So this is how we make stars. I've glossed over a lot of the details. Um, there is lots of cool stuff. There's a lot of research going into this field because we want to know where do planets and life come from and one of the best places to look is around forming stars where we think planets are also in the process of being formed.